This video today is a full Dynasty startup draft from a different channel. I went on to Dynasty Football Flock, you know, the Fantasy Football Flock people, Mason, that squad of birds over there. He invited me onto his channel yesterday. We did a live stream. So some of y'all might have caught this already. Some of y'all might have not even known it happened. I don't like to let content go to waste. I want it to go to as many eyeballs and ear holes as humanly possible. So I wanted to re-upload on my channel for those of y'all that don't subscribe to him. And if you do not, please go over there and do so. I will link his channel in the description. This was a 12 round super flex dynasty startup draft i drafted from the 103 he drafted from the 106 i want to say and it was a live stream on his youtube channel so we were bringing in some comments and questions along the way if any of you guys as we mentioned in the video at one point want to join any dynasty leagues we are organizing them for you for free in our discord the link to join our discord will be down below as soon as you get in there there will be a welcome message that hits you that directs you on how to join a dynasty league the leagues are not free you got to buy in and play and you know you're competing for money we are just organizing it with you in internally for free. We're not making you sign up for a membership or a subscription in order to access these leaks. All right, I'll be quiet. My shirt will be tucked in the next scene. Enjoy the film. See y'all tomorrow. Okay, this is a very exciting live stream here. We have the big dog. We have the king of TikTok, the king of YouTube. We have, I mean, pr probably someone everybody already knows. Do, do we even need to give you an introduction? I mean, you can give me a correct one. I feel like you've way flew by us on the uh, on YouTube, we had you on the channel last week to which you didn't wear a suit. And now I was embarrassed about uh, coming on with a, sh with a suit and you not wearing one again. So therefore, I just put on like a schoolboy outfit and uh, and then you ruined it for me. See, well, the thing is, I'm playing mind games. Before we even get in here, I, I need to make sure I have the mental edge. I need to make sure that you're a little shook up, which I, I think we've done so far. Is that correct? I mean, we threw you for a loop. We were supposed to go live 10 minutes ago. And either I had technical issues or Nick was busy doing vocal warmups. I think the audience can decide on which one is true there. But I, I think that should be it for an intro. Of course, we have Nick BDG. Y'all can find his YouTube, Twitter, TikTok, everything in the description. And is there anything else that you want to plug real quick? Uh, plug, no. I... um. I actually wanted to ask you about the haircut. Like you cut the lettuce off a little bit. I don't think I've ever seen you. I mean, I don't watch your videos every single day, so I don't really like take into consideration how your hair routine typically works, but you usually got, you usually got flow. You got lettuce going, right? Why, why the cut? So a couple things. One, I am very, very cheap. So whenever I get a haircut, I make sure that haircut's going to last a very long time, if that makes sense, you know? So you if I get a haircut, get a I don't want to have to go through and get it done every once a month. It'll be, I get three haircuts a year. Cut it all off and we'll let it go until it looks very bad and then go cut it all off again. And sometimes in the middle, it looks decent. But yeah, we've had some nice people on YouTube. I mean, earlier this week, I was told I look like a 50 year old lesbian woman, which was <laughs> nice to hear that. But yeah, I mean, I mean, we're rolling with it now and we'll see where it takes us. No, it, it looks good. I um, I when I first moved into like I, I moved out of my mom's house and the first apartment I got on my own. Uh, was when I kind of first started getting into the YouTube space and I wasn't like financially set up. I had a, I had some momentum going and I was like, man, living in New York, like haircuts are expensive, man. I need to like start cutting business expenses. So I actually bought a buzzer and I started cutting my hair like six or seven years ago. And I've done it since I haven't got a professional haircut in like seven years, which is why hey, that's, you a, ever that's come impressive. Up, you want to be able to tell. Well, I mean, half the time is why I wear a hat because I can't I still don't know how to do it well. <laughs> so I'm yeah. hiding hiding my head most of the time. But I'll tell you what, if you, it's a valuable skill, you know, teach yourself to fish or whatever that fucking phrase is. That's the same way I look at haircut for content creators. Well, as we go through this, do you mind if I have like a small little advertisement on the screen for flockfantasy.com? I do mind. Yeah. Don't you dare. Okay. Well, it's just going to be small. <laughs> we don't have to worry about it too much, but I think <laughs> we should be good to go from here. Let's go ahead and let's hop into this. <laughs> but, okay. No, obviously, that's a joke there. Uh, okay. We've had a lot of people waiting for about 10, 15 minutes in this mock draft room. Let's pray to God that nobody auto drafts because if someone does, oh, it's going to be ugly. It is going to be ugly. But I think you grab the 103. I grab pick six. I mean, makes a lot of sense. If you want a good dynasty team this offseason, you kind of have to get a pick inside the top six if you want to be able to grab a decent quarterback. I mean, if you're picking at eight, picking at nine, I mean, good freaking luck starting a dynasty draft off with a Justin Fields compared to a team that's able to get. I mean, I'm sure you're going Joe Burrow at pick three. Um, Burrow is a 
contemplation for me here. I expected it to go Josh Allen, Joe oh, Burrow. Oh, shit, I didn't even see Allen, sorry. As the top three, yeah. So the fact that Hurts kind of jumped in there, I'll be happy with either of these dudes. I don't really care. I'll just take Josh Allen right now because I, I feel like he's got more consistent upside as a fantasy player. Does Joe Burrow have more longevity? Possibly. He feels a little bit more like standard. He feels a little bit safer as a guy who's going to be, you know, the head of the franchise for 15 years. But I think we're probably going to get that with Josh Allen too. So I'm not really going to think too hard about it. Yeah, no, you're 100 percent right. I didn't notice that Josh Allen was making it to three. I'm used to just Mahomes, Allen, one, two, auto. Yeah, you've been focusing too much on throwing ads on the screen. Maybe, exactly. maybe a little bit more, more grinding. <laughs> maybe just, maybe just a tad bit. Yeah. Okay, so Justin Herbert off the board at five. I mean, we're going to go ahead. We're just going to take a quarterback. I know most people would say to go through and take Justin Jefferson. I completely understand why, but based on how hard it's going to be to find quarterback value later on, I'm just going to go ahead and take Trevor Lawrence here. Yeah, Lawrence is kind of an interesting one for, I mean, both Dynasty and Redraft. We're seeing a big swing, especially if you're starting to do best ball drafts earlier on in the year. We're starting to see a um, a big swing of like the one quarterback leagues having the top guys getting picked within the first three rounds. There's still like a tier gap where Trevor, like has there any, is, has there ever been something more obvious than Trevor Lawrence is going to jump into the elite tier of fantasy quarterbacks after this year? Like everything is set up for that to come to fruition, but yet he's still like a tier below these other guys. And I get it statistically he hasn't made the jump yet, but I don't know. I've never been more confident that something like that will happen. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I would understand from like a redraft perspective, if you want to go through and take someone with the rushing upside, like Justin Fields, Lamar Jackson over Lawrence. But if you're just looking at what you're going to get with the security of Lawrence at the same time, I feel like that's going to be something that's kind of hard to pass up on. Yeah, dude. I, I, I I just feel like the quarterback landscape is just so healthy. There's just so many studs entering the league and you feel pretty good about any of the top 10 guys. They're all athletic. They're all good throwers. Um, Dynasty wise though. Yeah. I'm happy to get one of those quarterbacks up there. We got Bijan first back off the board at one eleven. Is there anyone, uh, are you considering anyone above Bijan as a dynasty RB one? Um, right now I have Bijan as the RB1, but I have him in the same tier as like Brees Hall, Kenneth Walker, Jonathan Taylor. I'm not going to fault anybody if they wanted to go with one of the other guys over Bijan until we get confirmation of the draft capital and landing spot. In reality, I don't think you can really make a wrong decision between those four guys. Hey, Rich up at 2-4. That's yeah, interesting. I, I was going to be targeting him in the third, fourth round if he would have made it, but so second one would have been a little too rich for me. Yeah, they always get a premium. I think it matters when you draft, too. I feel like, you know, there's so much hype. Like, everyone's just super focused on rookies at this time. So, if you did a startup draft, let's say, in August, I feel like the Anthony Richardson, the C.J. Strouds, the Bryce Youngs would probably be going in the third round, like early third round. That's where a lot of the rookie quarterbacks end up getting picked, I feel like, when you're in startup drafts. I love that pick by you, by the way. Yeah, this is what I do literally every single draft, is I just scroll down the ADP, grab Garrett Wilson in the second round. It's, like, the easiest thing ever. Like sleeper is great, obviously for dynasty, but one thing that is just horrible and I don't know how they haven't fixed is the ADP is always so messed up. Oh yeah. Okay. This is beautiful now. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Oh fuck. Brees Hall. I didn't realize I had another pick before me. I wanted to grab Brees there really, really, really badly. Um, I'm kind of contemplating between one of the running backs that you mentioned before and hmm. I'm going to take Amon Ra here. I just feel like he is – we just know what we're getting out of him. He's a bona fide stud. He's he's young. He's For me, he's kind of in that tier with Garrett Wilson where it's like you get one of these cornerstones that – I mean, he's done it in back-to-back -back years now. I don't think it matters what quarterback is there. Jameson Williams, yes, he's going to come in and, and play a piece, but any questions that I had about Amon Ra were answered within about a month of the 2022 season. So Amon Ra is a guy that you know you build your team around in Dynasty. Yeah, what do you think about Jamison Williams going over to Detroit? Uh, I'm excited for the offense. Uh, I think he might be – he's someone that like people are wildly excited about. I was looking at keep trade cut dynasty wide receiver rankings, and he's ahead of like a lot of really, really good veterans that are going to help your team win immediately. Uh, give me a second. Hmm. Let me get a little spicy here. I'm going to grab C-Mac. Interesting, interesting. Yes. Um, so, Jameson Williams is he, he's very highly regarded right now. I don't think I take him as high as where he's probably going in startup drafts right now. Uh, I think he might be, at least for the time being, the next year or two, a better real-life player 
uh, than he is fantasy player. Uh, they just, you know, they just started getting him situated last year towards the end of the year. And I feel like, I don't know, from what I saw, it just feels like Amon Ra's still the alpha. I know the draft capital is there with Jamison Williams, but they have, you know, a lot of weapons. They love to to pound the ball on the ground. So I just don't know what the volume could be like for Jamison Williams when Amon Ra's there getting eight targets a game, 10 targets a game, and and they want to run the ball with, you know, David Montgomery now, DeAndre Swift now. So Jameson Williams, like, he'll have his ups and downs, but better in best ball, as they say. Man, that is literally my exact statement. I mean, I think that Jamison Williams will be good from a real-life perspective and he'll make the Detroit Lions offense better. But I still think Amon Ross St. Brown's going to get all the volume. Like, Jamison's just going to stretch the field, keep two safeties back, allow Amon Ross St. Brown to eat underneath. I mean, that's why I, I think that, honestly, you can go out there and get Amon Ross St. Brown still at a fair price point because a lot of people are, in my mind, too optimistic about Jamison Williams. Yeah, it's it's like th- this happens so often with um, with players in Dynasty. It almost feels like if you have to convince yourself of why a player uh, like why a player did so well and why he's not going to be good next year, you're probably thinking about things in the wrong way. Like most players yeah. waste their time trying to convince themselves that a guy who hasn't been good yet is going to be good rather than taking the players that have already been good and telling you why they're not going to be good next year after proving to us like over and over again. That kind of feels like what's going to happen here. Um, and then C-Mac he just feels like, I don't know, it's hard not to love what we saw out of him in San Francisco. He feels like even if we get two more really, really good years out of him in that offense, and obviously they're going to they're gonna get like the top level Christian McCaffrey out there in San Francisco because that's just what Kyle Shanahan does out of his running backs. That's enough for me to you know squeeze that line and try to get all of the juice out of there. And you took ETM, which is kind of interesting because I actually have C-Mac in a dynasty league and I'm getting trade offers where it's like, swapping ETN for C-Mac and then there are other pieces to the trade, but I'm trying to think through that again. And um, do you have ETN higher than C-Mac in Dynasty? Let me make a selection, then I'll go ahead and pull up my Dynasty rankings. I don't know if you've heard about this, but there's this really cool site. I just found it the other day. I think it's flockfantasy.com, something Mm. along those lines. I'm unsure if anybody here has heard about it, but it actually had all my rankings there somehow, some way. I don't know if they just ripped it from somewhere else. But I mean, if I'm going to be looking at my running back rankings, I have Christian McCaffrey and Travis Etienne in a very similar range. The reason I like going Etienne here, if I'm looking at them, I personally have Travis Etienne ranked running back five. Yeah, and I have Christian McCaffrey a little bit behind. But I think with Etienne, like you can select him and then still plan on having a youth-centric team for the long term, or you can plan on winning now. Once you take CMC in the third round, I feel like you're kind of pigeonholing the rest of your roster and saying, okay, well, we're going to win in 2023, if that makes sense. Yeah, okay. Now now, now we're in a pickle here. Hmm. This might be an outrageous pick. These 30-second clocks are getting to me. Yeah, no, 30, 30 seconds is tough. Uh, like it, underdog, it's fine because the ADP, you're never scrolling past the first well, five guys. Yeah, I mean, it's so also good. like you don't give a fuck when you're doing like a $3 draft and it's just like you're doing a 200 of them in a row. You're like, okay, <laughs> I got that guy. I'll just take the other guy 42 times in a row. I do like Christian Watson. I'm kind of, as I'm drafting in Dynasty, I feel like the strategy that I typically have uh, ends up being cemented after like the first round or two because I'll go a bunch of different directions when I'm early on. Like, say I'm picking at the one nine and I pick a certain player. I'm like, okay, maybe I'm going youth first. Maybe I'm going win now. After like the first two to three rounds, you kind of get a feel for where your team is going. Like after yeah. C-Mac, it might have been might have made more sense for me to go with like a Devonta Adams, despite the Raiders being in a little bit of a flux now. But C-Mac kind of points you towards a win now team where Christian Watson. I don't know about that. I'm actually kind of personally high on Christian Watson and Jordan Love as a duo there. I think Jordan Love sat behind Rodgers long enough. They seem like they're confident enough in uh, Jordan Love to be their future at quarterback. And I'm kind of getting on board with that as like two of the better values in fantasy. Again, Christian Watson's a dude that kind of falls into what I was just talking about, where he had such a good year and everybody's going to spend all offseason convincing themselves why he's not going to be good this year. And I get it. Like Rodgers is obviously gone. Do we have the deep accuracy coming from the QB position? But I'm, I'm probably higher on Jordan Love than the majority of the industry. Interesting. I have no idea what to expect with Jordan Love. Like I literally no idea. You don't think I'll pick him right now? <laughs> I, I encourage you to do it, my friend. I'm not going to do it at the 506, so I don't really care. I actually think this is probably where he'll go off in like real dynasty startups. Uh-huh. I think if you're in a sharp league, he'll probably go in the beginning of the fifth round. You know what? Do it. Dude, get the stack. I mean, you took Christian Watson. Yeah, fuck it. Let's run it. Since we're all here, baby. That could be disastrous. That could be some of the most disastrous dynasty drafting you've ever witnessed on television right there. 
Well, I think we just locked in that Rodgers will somehow be playing for the Green Bay Packers in 2023. <laughs> oh, whatever. That means Christian Watson will be super, super <laughs> yeah. good then. Yeah, no, I, I really have no idea what to expect with Jordan Love. Very similar to someone who goes after him with Will Levis. Like, I would honestly have taken Will Levis if he falls to the middle of the fifth. I mean, a quarterback that definitely has a high ceiling, but it's just it's such a wild card. It obviously depends on the price point that you're getting him. I'd say fifth round's not bad. I mean, I personally, I'm just not smart enough to know what we should expect. That's, um, I'm, I'm smart enough, so just listen to me, dude. I will, I will. Oh uh, my what God. the hell am I doing here? Um, see, yeah, dude, it's tough. Am I going to go Najee Harris? Okay. Three running backs, so we're so we're stapling the team with backs. I get nervous doing that in startup drafts a little bit, be, just because I feel like wide receivers are are just so much easier to plug into your lineup and keep them on your team for longevity. Where these running backs just like cycle in and out, and if you don't have a top pick, if you don't have you know top five startup pick or not startup pick, but like uh, in your rookie drafts, it's tough to really get running backs that are reliable. Where wide receivers are just sprinkled all over the place. Yeah. I mean, the thing about the running backs I do take here is they are all on rookie contracts or Jameer Gibbs obviously will be on that rookie deal. So I personally value like running backs that still have the security of their rookie contract mm -hmm. a little differently than I would like Austin Eckler in the middle of the fifth round here, if that makes sense, or Tony Pollard on the yeah. franchise tag. So, I mean, I, I'm not too excited about that Najee Harris selection, but if we're looking at him where he goes in comparison to the rookies, I mean, you have seven rookies going in front of him. So it's like Najee Harris for the 108. And at that point, I'm kind of fine paying that price tag. And I think that this team is decent enough to be able to compete this season, to be honest. Yeah, Najee makes me nervous a little bit, though. I, I, the last season, I feel like, left me scarred a little bit. I wasn't, like, super high on Najee, but I took him high in one of my important leagues, and it just absolutely made me, uh, like, emotionally distressed for the entire season because he was so – he was just so mid, you know, and not yeah. till the end of the season did he start going off. And it kind of just feels like – when you watch him play, Jalen Warren looked about 40 times more explosive than Najee Harris at any given time, and I find it extremely difficult to believe that he's not going to be a big piece of the Steelers offense or at least really form some sort of committee where he's getting 10 touches a game and Najee Harris is not super involved in the passing offense. So I question what Najee Harris's actual ceiling is over the course of a season again when I don't know when a player is inefficient with a whole lot of touches that typically tends to play itself out over the long run where the touches start to diminish, whether that's over a year or two years or three years, usually comes to play itself out. Maybe Najee is really good. Maybe he was running behind a really shitty offensive line last year. Maybe Kenny Pickett brought down the ceiling of the offense. You know, a lot of question marks, obviously. But I think if I'm going in the middle of the fifth round and it's guys like that where I'm not super confident in as it relates to like fantasy dynasty running backs, I'll probably go with a younger maybe safer um, wide receiver that I feel like will hold value for sure. Cause Najee Harris has one more down year. Like it's kind of over for him. I feel like as, as, uh, as far as like his value in dynasty is. Oh, uh, definitely. I mean, when, once you start trending downwards, which Najee was a first round pick last year in dynasty startups, I mean, two years in a row of just horrible production, then yeah. And this is a player that can fall a decent amount from here. But I was actually really hoping Quentin Johnson was going to make it back to me in the mm. sixth round. He doesn't. So I'll go with the wide receiver I have ranked directly behind Quentin Johnston. I'll go ahead and take Jordan Addison here at the nice. 607. I mean, if I'm looking at this range for him, I'd personally probably rather have Quentin Johnston, Jordan Addison over a few of the names that go above them, such as Traylon Burks, Javante Williams. So I'm fine with taking Addison in the middle of the six, especially when we kind of needed another wide receiver going with only Garrett Wilson through the first five. Hmm. Jamo, thank God someone took him. I was almost, I almost uh, thought about going with the Detroit stack there, and I probably even could have got Jared Goff on the way back. Yeah, it would have made a lot of sense to be honest. Uh, I don't think I'd ever take Goff right now. I feel like he's got to be out of there soon. Hmm. Okay. 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 Let's see. Ooh, there's a lot of me that wants to grab a lot of good young wide receivers right here that I feel pretty comfortable taking. Um, I. I weirdly am getting higher and higher on um, DJ Moore going over, going over to Chicago. I know there's a lot of hate with Justin Fields as it relates to like his passing production. And it makes sense. His numbers were God awful, but he was a great passer in college. And I think objectively, when you step back and just look at the situation he was in last year, I don't know what people um, expected out of him from a passing game. Like they didn't have an offensive line. They had no wide receivers. Like, they were so, so, so bad. 
and if he if he hits a stride, I mean, we saw the production that his wide receivers put up in college, where I know that's not a great comparison because there are a lot of you know pro players that are going to do dynamite in college. But I, I think DJ Moore makes that entire offense better because it asks everyone underneath him to shift down a spot. You don't need Mooney. You don't need Claypool being the wide receiver ones there. Now they're now the two and three and Cole Komet's in there and their offensive line has been improved. And now they have picks to make that even better. So it's like I think the situation is going to be great. I think Fields is going to take a huge step up. Um, in the passing side of things, he'll obviously still run because he's a great athlete. But I like more as a wide receiver one there, as Fields like steps into you know his fucking alpha zone here. My man, I'm sorry to do this. I I hate Justin Fields, and this is what I get by far and away the most hate for on uh, YouTube. Okay, like I actually let, let me go back a little bit with this DJ Moore selection because everybody's gonna be pissed if I don't here. So a couple things: one, the Chicago Bears had the worst passing offense in the NFL this past season since 2009. Like. Mm -hmm the worst passing offense in modern history. So I think that you're right in that the Chicago bears passing offense in terms of the volume they'll see will be significantly better, right? I think we can all say the Chicago bears are probably going to be the most improved offense in the NFL this next season. They're probably not going to earn the number one overall pick again. I, I think that's a safe mm -hmm. statement, but if you get down to the numbers, like if you assume that Justin Fields improves by 30%, like it, I would say that makes him easily the most improved player in the NFL. He has, 30% more passing yards per game. He's averaging 194 passing yards per game this next season. And if DJ Moore commands 30% of the most improved offense in the NFL, he's still averaging 58 receiving yards on a per game basis, which puts him as a wide receiver three. And I know you're saying that Justin Fields was great in college. If you look at Justin Fields in college, he had Garrett Wilson, Jackson Smith and Jigba, Chris Olave, Jamison Williams, and he averaged 260 passing yards per game. The next season, CJ Stroud was almost at 400 passing yards per game. So I think Fields is an elite fantasy option given the rushing upside. But I mean, I, trust me, way more people agree with you. Way more people think that you are right on this one. I just personally have a hard time getting behind Fields supporting weapons through the air. If that well, I, I think what you said makes a lot of sense. I think um, it's it's probably one of those situations where people like a certain player and they like a certain player because the player does one or two things really, really well. And then that starts to seep into other aspects of their game where people just like talk themselves into it. Right. Where um, I've used this example on my channel a few times where it's like, all right, Kenny Gainwell coming out of college, amazing pass catcher, no disputing that, but people liked him so much in that department that they started telling themselves that he was like a phenomenal running back. Like he was a phenomenal runner. He's yeah. like, Hey, all this and all that. It's, it just wasn't really true. And it's like, you could like one part about a game and also objectively, tell yourself that this is you know he's not good at this other part of the game and I think with um guys like Kendry Miller we have a lot of running backs coming out this year where I'm really high on Kendry Miller I love his running style I think he's a phenomenal running back doesn't really catch passes and I could object I, I'm not going to say like oh it's because he's never given the chance to it's like he could I could really like him as a runner and also say I'm going to put him a little bit further down the rankings or a little bit you know lower in the tiers because I don't think he's going to catch passes and that could be the case with Justin Fields where it's like so good at fantasy just may never be a great passer. But I also like caution myself and other people not to, I, I try not to look at it so um, objectively like that. We're like, if he takes a 30% uh, increase in whatever, because we see steps, we, te we see jumps that are extremely dramatic from players who we think are outliers. And I feel like Justin Fields is a dude who can absolutely be one of those players that gets into an outlier position where he throws for 250 passing yards per game. I wouldn't be surprised if he's up there uh, over 200, over 225, over 250. Now, does that seep over to DJ Moore? That might become, you know, more of a question mark. But we've seen what DJ Moore did with quarterbacks who don't put up numbers, who are super safe and on the worst part of being safe, like quarterback 20 type safe. And I just feel like Justin Fields is better than that. So I try not to um, overthink a situation like that, especially, you know, down at the at the like 6'10", when all the other guys going around him are probably the same age, probably less upside, maybe a little bit more unknown. Well, the guy in the live chat whose profile pick is Justin Fields says DJ Moore is actually going to be a top 12 wide receiver over Devontae Adams. So I think you got this one, my man. I mean, I, I had I read that before I started talking, I wouldn't have even said anything. I <laughs> yeah, I, 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 think he, I, I think he did the job for you. I think he explained everything we <laughs> needed to hear. I'm going to go ahead and take Derek Carr. I have no freaking idea if Derek Carr is good or not. The man has no rushing upside, but I need a quarterback too. He signs a contract, which pretty much guarantees he's going to be a starting quarterback this next season and probably in 2024 as well. So not an exciting selection, but at the same time, he's going after Josh Downs. I mean, right before Deontay Johnson, 
we need a quarterback. So might as well go ahead and take him with the contract. I like it. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to go down the quarterback route as well. I already have two QBs, but if this is a real dynasty startup, I'm I'm for sure getting three dudes that I feel super comfortable with. I can go with someone young like Mac Jones. Uh, I feel like Geno Smith is uh, someone I feel super comfortable with right now. He just got the extension, which I know only locks him in for probably like two years maximum. It's a three-year deal. I think they could cut him and save a ton of money off the cap after the second year. They might draft a rookie quarterback this year to kind of groom. But Geno Smith, what he did last year was crazy, and I feel like there is a chance that he's just straight up a good quarterback and stays a starting quarterback in the league for the next he might get another contract after Seattle where he's a starting quarterback for another two to three years. And as your QB three and super flex, I, I want to make sure that I cement that. Um, I want to make sure I cement that position above all else. Cause everything else is tradable for you'll never find a position. Like you'll never find these quarterbacks as easily attainable as you will in the startup. Like Sean Tucker right now at the eight eleven, right? Like he's someone that's probably getting picked in rookie drafts at like the one twelve, the two Oh five, the two Oh eight, depending on what league you're in you're not able to trade the 205 or the 208 for Geno Smith. You need to trade a first-round rookie pick to get him. There's never a cheaper time to get starting quarterbacks than in the actual startup draft. Yeah, I definitely would have taken Geno Smith if Derek Carr would have gone before. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that Geno, Carr, those quarterbacks that have the guaranteed starting jobs the next two years are great picks in the eighth round for all the reasons you said. Hell yeah. All right, let's see what we got. Man, the pressure is on. Oh yeah, I, I can I can feel it, and we're across the country. <laughs> um, this is probably where I look to grab a tight end. Um, I'm going to grab. Oh shit. Okay. All right. Well, we took Michael Mayer. I think. Um, I think the point of the selection there was to go with a young tight end and just kind of cement that position. I like Mayer. We'll see if he's the first guy off the board. He's not my rookie tight end one right now i still have dalton kincaid over him but kincaid not participating at the combine or the pro day might drop him off boards into like the second round so if that's the case i might go with mayor uh, we'll have to see how the draft plays out um i think what i would might do differently if i were to go back was take one of these mid-tier guys like i really like dallas goddard i think he's going to be a stud for like the next four or five years using a six round pick on him a seventh round pick he obviously went a little bit earlier than that but he feels like my my game plan that was like my game plan for redraft last year i was like goddard in the sixth seventh eighth round every single time and your team will be pretty set and i feel that kind of carried over into dynasty for me this year I definitely I mean Goddard's literally improved every single season of his NFL career from a receiving yards per game perspective. Like he looked like he was going to be a league winner before he got injured this past season. Oh yeah. And now he's getting picked, you know, one spot before Pat Fryermuth, who I like Fryermuth, but like Goddard shown Goddard shown like another level to his game, it feels like. And now he's tied to Hertz. Yeah. I mean, I think you could also, if you were wanting to go with that mid-round tight end, I mean, obviously I have literally zero at tight end, but I feel like Kittle six ten wouldn't have been bad either. Yeah, I didn't even realize he went afterwards. I, yeah, Goddard, Kittle, both of them I'm absolutely cool with. I, I thought about Komet over Michael Mayer here. I actually like Komet a little bit, but again, like how many pieces? This, is, this has been a theme for me. I actually am curious on your take about this, drafting dudes from similar teams. So I had the uh, opportunity, uh, almost the opportunity, I would have to think about it, taking Jameson Williams and Antonio, uh, uh, Amon Ross St. Brown. And then I took another Detroit player, DeAndre Swift. And had I not taken Swift, I would have thought about taking David Montgomery here, and I might think about taking him at the 10-10 if he drops me here, but I'm like, do I really want the entire Detroit backfield? You know, what, what, what is your take on, like, taking dudes that are on the same team if you're unsure about their offense? You know, like, normally I'm like, okay, if they're a great offense, I don't really care. Like, I want as much of that as I possibly can, but it's kind of up in the air. Yeah, personally, what I always try to do, regardless of if that's dynasty or best ball, is just correlate my bets where the last thing I ever want to do is finish like fifth, sixth, seventh place in a dynasty league. I would rather just make that consolidated bet like we do with the Jacksonville Jaguars offense here saying, mm -hmm. okay, well, if Trevor Lawrence does take that next step, turns into the elite level quarterback, and we have a league winner with Trevor Lawrence, I also want to make sure we're hitting on someone else in that offense. I want to make sure that we're hitting on Travis Etienne. Very similar to if you were drafting both Amon Ross St. Brown, Jameis Williams, if the Lions offense crushes, you're going to, I mean, be rewarded double. I mean, that's not even a word, but we're <laughs> going to make it work here. And vice versa, if the offense fails, Boo freaking who? Yeah, your team's going to be really bad. You'll get a very early startup pick, but 
I always try to polarize my outcomes in these leagues. When you don't get paid any money for having sixth place, seventh place, fifth place, fourth place, you know, I either want to be first or last and really nothing in between. So I personally like the idea of going through and taking multiple pass catchers from the same team and making that one bet that the passing offense is better than expected. Obviously taking like two running backs from the same team is a little bit different. I think it's going to be a little more nuanced based on the players themselves, as well as the offense they're in and the price you're getting them. Yeah. I think, um, I think a lot of times it's uh, everyone loves to look at like correlation, things like that. But again, it's, it's very difficult to actually materialize that in a very small sample size. I think a, a little common sense goes a long way too. people often say, I don't like to take a wide receiver and a running back on the same team, but it's like, if it's a good offense, if your wide receiver is doing well, that means the offense is staying on the field yeah. more times than not. It means there's probably more scoring opportunities. So it usually pivots over to, um, to the running back as well. Now we're seeing a, a rip of running backs go off. I know. And I was thinking about getting someone like Algier on the way back around. So now I have no idea what the hell to do. Um, let's go ahead. Uh, tight ends. In my mind, like all these guys are about the same. I'd be fine with whoever we get on the way back around in the 11th. Yeah. Uh, we're going to make a horrible pick. We're going to go through and take Matthew Stafford here in the middle of the 10th round. Confident Stafford's a starter in Los Angeles this next season. Maybe, just maybe, the Los Angeles Rams, when they're fully healthy, are going to be a great NFL offense yet again. Very similar to Carr, Mac Jones. The ceiling is severely capped based on the man having literally zero rushing upside whatsoever. So it's a hard pick to sit here and champion and say, oh, I'm smarter than all of y'all. I got Matthew Stafford in the middle of the 10th round, but it's a selection that I'm fine making. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Let's see. Man, people do people do not like... Okay, here's another conundrum. Do I go... I think I feel better. I, I was deciding between Keenan Allen and Tyler Lockett. Now I have Geno Smith. Maybe Tyler Lockett makes sense. I think Tyler Lockett's one of the more underrated players. I think my redraft mind started to think about Tyler Lockett. And I'm like, I don't know how long I want to hold on to him for. Keenan Allen was awesome last year when Justin Herbert was in the lineup and he was in the lineup. He was hurt for the beginning of the season. But when he got back, he was averaging like, here are the last seven games he played in. 14 targets, 14 targets, 9 targets, 14 targets, 6 targets, 11 targets, 13 targets, including the playoff game. I, I, there was nothing I saw out of Keenan Allen that made me feel like he's a worse separator than he's been in previous years. And I mean, their offense was miserable. They were only dinking and dumping the entire year, but they do have Kellen Moore coming over as their OC now. And I, I'm, I'm excited to see if they let him fucking rip over there. Cause Kellen Moore was high pace, productive, high volume passing offense when he was in Dallas for the entirety of it and made them one of the most productive offenses, at least statistically the entire time he was there. Um, if he could transfer over 80% of that to the chargers, I think this passing offense is going to be absolutely beautiful here. I'll just say, as you think for your next pick real quick, what I usually do with these veteran wide receivers like Keenan Allen, Tyle Lockett that are both going to turn 31 this off season is I usually just honestly look at underdog ADP and say, okay, if I'm drafting this guy, it's really only going to be for 2023 and 2024. Anyway, mm -hmm. the underdog ADP is probably sharper than anything that I'm going to be able to come up with on my own. Oh, so yeah. I, like kind of using that as a cheat code and saying, okay, well, if I'm drafting this player just for his production this next year, where are the current expectations based on the redraft crowd with them? Obviously, you're going to have to make manual adjustments like Keenan Allen inherently is going to go lower on underdog with it being best ball and half PPR compared to Tyler Lockett. But just using that as a general like guide, I like. Yeah, no, I like that too. And I ended up pairing Keenan Allen with a player that very well might be picked by the Chargers in this year's draft. But I mean, if you can get a dude that um, Jalen Hyatt almost feels like way less predictable than a Jahan Dotson, but similar to like where Jahan Dotson was going last year, where you were able to get a first round pick at the ninth, 10th, 11th round. And I don't even care if I think he's good at that point. I'm going to let the draft capital kind of speak for itself. And everything we've heard pretty much up to this point is Hylett's probably going within the first 40 picks of the NFL draft. I don't think he drops much more than that. And I think there's a 50, 50 chance he ends up being a first round wide receiver. So I'm like, you can get him in the 11th round of the draft and um, you know, Keenan Allen's on his way out. Maybe Hyatt takes a year or two to develop boom kind of slots in there. So this is a ton of really good value. This is where I usually go by draft capital, young wide receivers. This is like the sweet spot. Oh, definitely. I, I mean, with Jalen Hyatt, 
It feels like a pick that doesn't have much downside, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Like you could see Juju, Gabe Davis, not really being drafted inside the top, like 200 picks of dynasty startups next year. Maybe that's a little aggressive, but you could see them falling off the face of the planet. Jalen Hyatt goes round one in the NFL draft. It almost doesn't even matter how bad his 2023 season is. He'll still hold on to some dynasty value. And on the opposite end of the spectrum as well, I mean, if Jalen Hyatt were to go out there and have, say, a great season, even if it's unlikely, the second that that happens, he actually has the ability to kind of move up these dynasty rankings in a dramatic way. Like if Hyatt goes out there and is a low and wide receiver two year one, you could see him going in round six, round seven, where like Jahan Dotson's going now. Whereas if you're looking at the other wide receivers on the board, such as like Darnell Mooney, Juju Smith-Schuster, Gabriel Davis, if they have a low end wide receiver two season next year, are they going in the sixth round? Probably not. They're probably going to be staying exactly where they are now. So, I mean, I think yeah. it's a pick that has upside, not too much downside. Yeah, and it's like Hyatt, um, I actually almost feel like he could have a similar trajectory to how Gabriel Davis started off, where he wasn't like super highly regarded. He's going to get way, way more draft capital, but Gabriel Davis, uh, you know, 600 yards, seven touchdowns as a rookie is by most metrics, like very, very good and just kind of puts you on the path of a high trajectory. And that's all we need. Like we just need a little bit of momentum um, of from these rookie wide receivers for someone in your league to really like them and think that they're going down the right path. And that's kind of the beautiful part about dynasty is like, you don't even really need to hit on all your players. You just need to have players that continue to have momentum in one way or another. You need one guy to like a single player in order for that player to deliver. We're in like redraft leagues, you know, the trades are not that active. So it's like, you pick a player, you kind of need them to hit or else they're useless to you. Like maybe you can move them, but dynasty is a whole nother animal with it. I like what uh, Bryson Locke did there at the turn, Khalil Herbert and Rashawn Johnson. Oh, yeah. Seems late for Khalil Herbert. If you're looking at where he's going in underdog drafts right now, he's going way before this. Yeah, he was just down in the – that's just like a sleeper ADP thing, I think. I had him yeah. start, and I didn't realize how far down he was. Dalton Kincaid off the board. I was going to take Kincaid here in the 12th round and just kind of double up on tight ends. I don't know if we even want to at this point. I may take someone that is kind of gross, but everybody here is kind of gross. May go ahead and take Kadarius mm. Tony. I mean, with Tony. Who the hell knows if he's any good? He's probably not, but he's <laughs> locked into playing with Patrick Mahomes this next season. If you're locked into playing with Patrick Mahomes, I mean, it's hard to find a better situation, if that makes sense, especially as you have Juju Smith-Schuster, as you have McCole Hardman leaving Kansas City. I mean, yeah, as you have Travis Kelsey turning 34 years old, even if we don't think he's necessarily good, the man will still, at the end of the day, be in a phenomenal situation, and he's very young at the same time. No, it was a good pick. I would have taken him if you didn't. Um, I'm a fan of Tony. I yeah, it's it, it's crazy how he can be in the league for so long, and we still have no fucking idea if he's any yeah. good besides like being cool on a on a play to play basis. And now we see these rookie running backs rip off. And I was gonna do the same thing. It's just so hard to actually zone in on like a Tank Bigsby versus a Kendra Miller versus a Tajay Spears without knowing where they go in the draft. Uh, there's no real super young, exciting wide receivers left. Um, you know what? Fuck it. Let's pair it with another rookie tight end. I uh, I really like the rookie tight end class, so maybe one of these guys will hit with upside. I think both those guys are first round picks. Awesome. Well, last pick, Tom Brady. I honestly love it. I mean, Respect. if you're just looking at the moral support and the locker room presence that you're going to get there, I don't think Darnell Mooney is going to be that good, but if Tom Brady's in his locker room telling him to do the right things, it's probably going to get better, and we can say that from top to bottom. But here's the overall roster. I think, um, do you have any... Uh, thing you want to talk about here in particular like any surprises with this board i mean mm -hmm. i think the main surprises i'm seeing are the anthony richardson 204 one thing i want to ask you about because this is a player that i went all in on as a rookie just based off rushing upside and situation and it is not looking good right now what are you thinking about trey lance 402 uh, what's the thought process there yeah no nah, it's not going to be for me um i think trey lance's time in san fran is I think everything they've said and everything points to they don't want him to be the starter. Like if everyone's healthy, it's Brock Purdy. There's zero doubt in my mind. Like I have people that are near that franchise and like in that franchise that I've, I've spoke to about this and it's not it, Trey Lance is not the guy for them. I think they're just having a lot of trouble cutting bait with him. Do I think he gets another chance in another franchise? Of course, as a top three pick, you almost always get afforded that. The problem is like at a four, two, in a dynasty startup when you could literally grab Saquon Barkley or Cooper yeah. cup or like Jameer Gibbs or any of these dudes, the chance of Trey Lance possibly playing somewhere else and hopefully being good is just way too risky for me to, um, to bank on that. That guy kind of just went with, you know, 
players that he feels like have upside, like uh, Deshaun Watson there. I get it, but he played poorly enough last year that the 2-2 kind of scares me to go in on him, even though he is young and, like, I understand the pick. Um, yeah, Trey Lance for me is, I mean, he's he's probably like a sixth-round startup pick in these types of drafts. Okay, well, this will be the last time you're ever on the channel, but thank you for giving me your input on that. I mean, all jokes aside, I'm actually kind of right there with you. I completely understand. Now that the reports are coming out of San Francisco saying, you know what? Lance is probably not the guy, even though we paid three first-round picks to get him. I still think he's the player that has all the ceiling in the world from a fantasy football perspective, given the rushing upside. And if you were to be the starter there with how good that situation is. But I think at this point, we probably got to be taking Daniel Jones over him. I mean, I need to oh, go yeah. through and pull up flockfantasy.com and update my rankings because we <laughs> may or may not have. Let me see exactly where we have Trey Lance right now so you can roast me on this one. Let's get it. Okay. So, I mean, I can even swing this around. Let me. Let's pull this up. Yeah. I, I want to see how bad you think this is here. Okay. see how do i do this all right there we go let's pull this up quarterbacks mason sorts let's see where i have trey lance it's gonna be a fun thing for both of us here you got him at 18 oh what god we have him behind daniel jones okay that's not too too embarrassing here we have him behind daniel jones Tua, will levis what do you think lance or russell wilson where are we going there oh um God, two dead people. Yeah, I uh I mean, listen, I I I think you got to go Lance there. All right. Oh, Lance or Goff? Where are we going there? Uh Depends how the team is built up, but I'll go in a dynasty. I, I'm going to go Goff. Fuck it. I'm going to I'm going to play it safe okay. there and get a guy that I feel good about. Last question. I think this one is very interesting. Lance or Levis with Levis probably being a quarterback that you're kind of hitting the reset button with. He'll be a top 10 NFL draft pick. Most likely he has a little bit of rushing upside. I, I know I it seems like I'm a lot higher on Will Levis than most people in dynasty. I no, I, I'm with you there. Channel. I'll take Levis over Lance. Uh, if, if, if we know he's a top 10 pick, I'm taking Levis over Lance for sure. Cause I think most people are basically assuming they're fast forwarding Levis's career to where Trey Lance is now. They're just assuming yeah. he's going to bust. So Give me the dude that still has value, but I, I think Levis will probably be better than most people are not giving him credit for already. So yeah, give me give me the younger version of Lance, and that's Levis. I, man, I, I'm right there with you, but let's go. I think that's about it. Unless you want to field some questions from the audience, I do want to hear everything that you have going on. And I, I know you made an announcement that you were running some dynasty leagues for everybody, and wanted to hear your experience on that as someone who is been a little too adventurous in starting dynasty leagues with listeners it's it's interesting to see what is um going on how many leagues y'all have going at this point uh let me check real quick i want to say we're up to i think the 15th one either just started or i think the 15th one started so we started doing those for the yeah the members in our discord free to join uh -huh. if anyone wants to join dynasty league. we again we're, we're just very much trying to go back to the basics of uh, our company and our our brand and what that is is great fantasy content year round, great service and products for our audience that consumes that content, and then just documenting the process of what we're doing here. And I think the organization, like we we use so much time to educate people on dynasty and on the rookie class and stuff. And it's like a lot of people don't actually have access to playing in leagues where other people want to be competitive, other people want to play. Like it's easy to get a work league for redraft it's easy to get a friends league for redraft where they could stop paying attention four weeks in and it doesn't really matter it's not really detrimental to the league because the buy-ins are low but you can't do that with dynasty so it's like you can't grab 11 friends and say like hey let's do a dynasty league because they'll never take it seriously for a prolonged period of time and we know if everybody's watching our content you know watching dynasty content at this point of the year they want to play so we wanted to give um, an opportunity for people to do that and we actually did this we did this like three or four years ago in our discord um, a friend of mine, Noah, who actually now works at Underdog Fantasy, was like the organizer of it. And um, at that point, I think we put together close to 150 Dynasty Leagues. And that was a crazy undertaking. Oh, my God. Yeah. So the one the one piece of advice for you, um, 
you need somebody like really on top of it and monitoring it. So we have someone in the office right now who I basically was like, this is your project. Like you are the the project manager for this. Cause I'm not, I mean, it, 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 you turn into a customer service person. Anytime you run your own products or services, there are, you realize just how, um, ridiculous some people are. And I don't want to say that like to the audience, cause if I'm, buying a product that I don't know much about, or if I'm doing a service that I don't know much about, it's like an industry that I don't have any experience with. I'm the person that sounds stupid to the person who's been doing this their whole life. So you're dealing with people who are not as into what you've been like, we've been doing this every day for five fucking years straight, like day in and day out. So when they have questions or they don't know exactly what they're doing or why they join something, it's like, you have to be extremely um, empathetic to what they're going through and try to look at it from a UI UX experience. So you always need to when creating something, service product, as soon as you think you're done with it, run through the entire process and say, the dumbest possible person purchasing this, where can they go wrong along this path? And as you identify those spots, fix it. So before you launch that shit, before you announce it, have the pipeline set up. What are the rules? Do we have bylaws in place? In each channel, we need to have every single one of those pinned. We need to have a bot that lets you input your sleeper username, your email, so that if something goes wrong, if someone drops out of league without telling us, we can identify which member of the league it is. So it's all these problems that you need to project for prior to launching these things, because trying to do that on the fly becomes a problem and it takes you away from what you do best. And that's making high volume, high quality content. So um, it, it's a tough endeavor. If anything, if it's you just doing it by yourself, do it very slowly identify the pain points as you go and then scale up as you move forward. And you, I mean, you have a huge audience. I'm sure there's tons of people out there that would love to help you organize this. I think being in your discord and interacting with these people, you get a feel for who's really about your brand, who's, you know, intelligent, who can take over this type of responsibility and offload to them. And they're, they're happy to help. Oh, definitely. I mean, we've, Hosted like 30 dynasty leagues before. I mean, the undertaking is way more than you would ever assume. And that you're a better man for me than going through and taking that responsibility. I know that's going to help a lot of people out. And personally, I'm way too selfish to go through and dedicate myself to a massive project like that. But I dropped the link. We had peanut butter and waivers saying he'll hop in a dynasty league with BDG. I dropped the link to the discord in the live chat right now. If anybody peanut butter. Group, peanut butter is like. Out. Uh, he's everywhere, man. He's he's usually the first comment on all of my videos. I just respect the hustle. Sometimes I feel like some of the, the YouTube watchers are more hustlers than we are as the creators. Oh, 100%. 100%. Beautiful. Um, yeah, dude. I mean, it's an undertaking, but it's also like it's, it's such a good um, it, it's a good thing to have just for your business, too, because if you're the person introducing your season long audience to Dynasty, you also kind of fill the pipeline of every part of that funnel. Like you're introducing it to them then you're getting them into leagues. And then when they want to get more educated, they want to learn more about it. They're coming back to your content. And then they'll also come to you for any products or offerings that you have to teach them to be better, to give them tools and stuff. So it's kind of like a full circle thing where, yeah, we'll do it for free. We'll obviously organize the leagues for free, which takes investments of um, time and energy. But on the back end, it plays itself out. I think from a, from a branding, people are appreciative that you're doing it, obviously, but business too. Those people will always be like part of your brand and part of your pipeline. Yeah, no, it's really, really nice. And do you mind real quick if we answer a donation question? This guy paid 10 bucks. Feel bad if we hopped yeah, dude, off of course. Now, saying this. Yeah. Sorry if this is off topic. Would you trade the 305, 505 in a future first in exchange for the 204 and 1004? If I did the trade, we'd have the 105, 204, and 208. I'm assuming that this is going to be a startup league. And in my mind, a hell to the no, I'm not trading the 305, 505, and future first to move up to the second and get a 10th pat, 10th round yeah. in return. I agree with that. I think one of the biggest mistakes people make in startup drafts is like seeing the shiny prize of a first or second round pick and undervaluing depth on your team. Like I would, I would argue that like third, fourth, fifth, sixth round picks are wildly valuable. Like almost oh, yeah. more, you know, like a few of those are more valuable than the earlier picks um, because the depth matters so much in dynasty. I would also um, say this is kind of a rule that I have as it relates to trading and it doesn't always mean it's right. I don't make trade. I only make trades in two situations. I make trades. If a dude that I really like has fallen and I want to go up and get him, or I'm on the clock and I don't like any of the options. 
I don't trade just for the sake of trading. I don't trade a bunch of random numbers just to like mix things up and hopefully get value because you just never know what's going to happen. And it feels like you're trading laterally for no reason. You know, I, I don't know. I just feel like people get so trade heavy and they love doing it, but it doesn't, doesn't get you anywhere. If you, if you're trading up in a startup, you better be getting a top six pick so you can get an elite level quarterback. If not, yeah. you're wasting your time. hundred percent. But I think that's all we have. Thank you again, my friend for the time. Thank you for coming on. Really do appreciate it. And thank you for hosting all those dynasty leagues for everybody in the community Got helps you. the community out a ton. Someone has to do the hard work and looks like you are w willing to do that. Hell yeah. Well, thank you for having me. Had a blast as always uh, down to come on anytime, chop it up. Um, but yeah, dude, thank you.